Welcome back to Learning Solidity. Now in today's tutorial we'll be covering inline assembly within Solidity. I'm not going to go too deep into this, I'm just going to cover the basics to get people going. Now there are essentially two approaches to inline assembly within Solidity. The first is what people often refer to as pure, which is more instructional based assembly, which is more connected to traditional assembly. And then there is functional assembly, which is what I am going to cover in today's tutorial, where it's more function calls rather than sets of instructions. Now, to kick this off, um, we do have a whole page dedicated to Solidity assembly on the Solidity documentation, which I will leave a link in the description box down below. But for now, what we're going to do is jump straight into Remix. Now, what I have here is I've created a contract with two very basic functions. Now, the reason I've done this is because I'm going to create a, a inline assembly equivalency of both of these functions. Now, let's start with essentially loops. I always feel like with um, with assembly, a loop is kind of something that is is probably the easiest thing to actually understand and the easiest thing to get your head around. Um, we're going to use a couple of concepts that potentially JavaScript programmers would never have uh, encountered before. This is more for very low level programmers or sort of pre-existing assembly programmers. Pardon me. Now, the first thing we're going to do is take this native loops function, where it's essentially just looping over a value 10 times and then incrementing each, uh, each value in the sort of return statement. Now, let's try and create an inline assembly version of this. So we're going to create a function and we're going to call this assum loops. I'm going to make it public, returns, again, the same thing as above, a uint underscore r, and there we go. Now, we're not going to do any of the native Solidity functionality within this. The only thing that we're going to do, which is anything, which is remotely anything to Solidity, is define that we are going to be using some assembly. Now, that is the simple way of defining inline assembly. Now, it's probably uh, important to note, you'll get this uh, notification on the left-hand side, caution. This, uh, the contract uses inline assembly. This is only advised in rare cases, and I completely wholeheartedly agree. When you start going down the route of assembly, you're actually making what you're programming harder for people to understand and develop and work with. You should only really apply inline assembly when it's really, really necessary, or you really have um, uh, some requirement to get down the gas costs. Because the thing with inline assembly is gas costs are phenomenally low. So let's kind of get straight into our for loop. Now you can see the first thing in our for loop is we're assigning an integer or, or uint of i to zero. So we're going to actually do the same thing and we can assign an integer with a simple command, or we can assign a variable within Solidity, uh, in assembly, sorry, um, with a simple command known as let. So in just as the example above, so we're going to let i equal to zero. And that is as simple as it is really. And oh sorry, I forgot the assignment operator in inline assembly is slightly different. It's not equal to, it's colon equal to. So that is how you basically assign a value as i equals to zero. Now essentially everything within sort of the solidity is an integer. There's no concept of anything but an integer within the assembly level of solidity. Like with all programming languages. So anything that we assign is essentially just an integer. Okay, so we've assigned i is going to be zero. We don't need to define it as an integer because everything is going to be automatically assigned to integers. Now we're gonna to have to look at the loop. Now we're gonna use um, something known as labels and go to's to actually do this as you would with traditional assembly. So we're gonna simply create a label called loop because we're going to be looping over this um, X amount of times. Now let's have a look at what our for loop does. We increment i and increment r. So there's actually going to be no different to either of those. So to increment i, uh, what we're going to simply do is say i assignment operator. We are going to use the functional operator, uh, the functional inline assembly command add. So very, sim uh, very similar to what you would do if you're calling an add function, add i comma one. And all that's doing is every time we loop over, we're adding one to i. Now the next thing we want to do is similarly to i, we want to say underscore r is colon equal to add i comma one, and again we're incrementing r. So the only difference I've made a mistake for there is that should be underscore r. Pardon me. Right, and the next thing that we now need to do is a jump to. 
Now, basically, within uh, within sort of traditional assembly, what you would do is assign, if I remember this right from my old assembly programming days, is you would assign the uh, variable or the the value to your EAX uh, EAX register, and then you could actually execute comparator on that register. You don't have to do anything that complicated with inline assembly um, within Solidity. You can simply state that we're going to do a jump to. Now, if you just simply state jump, you can specify a label, say for instance loop. But the only problem with doing that is you've now created an infinite loop. So we need a conditional loop. So Solidity has something known as jump i. Now jump i will jump to the label loop if your second parameter returns one. So all we're going to do now is say, is similarly here, we want i to be less than 10. So it's simply less than, and then we're going to say it's i 10. So what i will do is basically say is let i equal to zero. So basically assigning i to zero. We're looping, we're first incrementing i, which is going to be one. Then we're going to increment r, which is going to be one again. Then we're going to check to see if i is less than 10, which it will be. So we'll go back to the loop label, which is here, and then continue the process over and over again until that we have until basically i is equal to 10 or equal to 10 essentially because obviously it can't exceed 10 because then that'd still be greater than 10. So what I'm going to do is just create that. Now we have native loops and we can see here from the details that we have returned 10. Now if we do the same thing with asm loops we also have 10. Now it is uh, probably worthwhile noting at this uh, point the gas cost between the two and this is the reason why you'd go to the low level of inline assembly if required because the gas cost of our native call costs 999 gas i know it's not much but when you're doing a lot of these calls it can stop adding some load to the network but our inline assembly was 702 so we almost cut almost basically 300 gas off our call for doing that inline assembly. Now I know, like I was saying before, this isn't always practical, and you know, it's, it's inline assembly is not the easiest thing to pick up. But if you need to save gas, trust me, try and try and do it with inline assembly. So the next thing I'm going to move on to now is our conditional statement. Now there is a couple of ways you could do this. You could use this go to statement as I have here, or you could use a case statement. Now, I know a lot of programmers have used case statements before, and even in JavaScript, there's case statements. In Solidity, there isn't. There is case statements within the confines of assembly, though, or inline assembly within Solidity. So we're actually going to do the same file, uh, function here. So basically, if you pass in a value, if it's equal to 5, it will return 55. If it's equal to 6, it will return 66. Otherwise, it will return 11. So let's do a, an equivalency of that in assembly. So let's say function, um, let's see, awesome conditional uint v public returns uint. And I'm actually gonna do an assignment of the return this time. Now I will go into why I'm going to do the assignment because in my next function, I will show you how to use the return method within assembly. It's a little bit different than what you'd expect for just returning a value. But like I said, I'll go into that into the next function. So what we're gonna do again, let's define our assembly block. Now in this one, what we're gonna simply do is create a switch statement. So switch, underscore v then case five i can never remember if you need a colon for this or not i don't think you do no you don't so case five underscore r colon equal 55 and the same thing again so we're switching on the value of v so basically we're stating that v is does it match case five or does it match, for instance, case six? If it does, sign case six, r underscore r colon equals 66. And like I say, th this is kind of very sort of simple sort of programming. It's like I say, it's not applicable to standard Solidity because this concept doesn't exist yet. It might do in later iterations of the Solidity development, but for now, this is the only way we can use a case statement. So if you actually did want to use a case statement, this is a great way to use one. And then we're also going to have the fallback of default to r colon equals 11. 
So let's have a look at that again. So let's clear that. Let's create our contract. Let's see if we can get rid of that. Now we have two conditions here. We have our native condition. So if I pass in five, call that, we have return of 55. If I call the ASM condition with six, check the details and we have a return value of 66. Again, it's worthwhile looking at the gas costs of these two. The actual gas cost of the native function was 249, but the actual gas cost of the ASM function was 285. Now the overhead of the switch statement actually makes this less viable than the native way of doing it. So that's always something to be mindful of. The actual compiler can sometimes improve your actual code. Now if I were to do this as a standard go to and jump and so forth, it probably would be better and it probably would use less gas. So for now I would usually just say let's avoid the whole sort of switch statement for now i think there's still some optimization to be done there but either way that's essentially how you use a switch statement now the final thing i'm going to do and cover as part of this is looking at memory allocation within solidity and this is where it brings me onto that return statement so let's create our final function so our final function is simply going to be asm returns and then we're just going to say public returns and we're going to say it's a uint. Now we're also going to state that we can actually pass in a value as well. So again, let's create our assembly. And what we're going to do now is do some memory manipulation. Now the reason that I have to do this with a return statement is because with return in Solidity, which I'll show you in the documentation, if I can find it without scrolling past it, somewhere down here, here we go, return. So we actually do have a return statement within the Solidity assembly, but the only difference is our return statement is a pointer to memory. So we now need to actually allocate memory to do anything before we can return it. So what I'm gonna use is two very basic methods. I'm gonna use mstore and actually I'm only gonna use mstore. I am going to use another value, another function here called msize. Now, the reason I'm using msize is because I want the ability to add this to the top, the end of the stack. Well, I see the end of the stack, the end of the block of memory that has been allocated for this. So we're actually going to assign more memory. So the first thing we're going to do is create a pointer to the maximum size of, of the memory. So let's just start with, again, before we're going to use, like similar to before, we're going to use um, let, create a value called ptr. And that is going to equal to m size. Now, the only thing is we want to actually add one to the size of the memory. So we're going to buy this. We're going to simply say add one. And that is the new pointer in memory that we're going to be allocating to. I'm not sure if you need the one. I'm still going to actually test that theory out. But I traditionally do that to ensure that I'm not going to be writing over any existing blocks of memory. It's always a way of allocating new memory if you want to allocate memory like that. So now we're going to do an M store. Then we're simply going to state the pointer and the value. So now that value is stored in memory. And then our simple, our, simply what we're going to do is return the pointer. Now you actually have to at this point return um, as part of the return statement. You have to state how much memory you want to return. Now because we define a uint, it's 250 oh, 265 bits. So we need to return a 32 byte, 32 bytes, if I'm correct with that. Yeah, 32 byte um, value, which um, I'm gonna do the hexadecimal value of, which would be OX20, I, just because I can remember off the top of my head because I've done a lot of stuff like that in the past. Now, you could obviously create a constant for this just to remind you that that is um, the, the sort of the 32 byte value. I do I hope I, I've got that right. If I haven't, feel free to correct me, pardon me. And essentially what that'll do now, so if I clear this and create this contract again, we now have the uh, ASM returns. Now, if I call this with any values, say like 15, what essentially we should have is a uint returned of 15. And all we've done there is essentially just allocated, um, or oh, sorry, let's just start from the beginning. We've first found the highest point of memory that's available to us. We've incremented it by one. So we've pointed the memory pointer to 
after all our memory's been allocated already just to ensure that we're not writing over any pre-existing memory because we never want to do that this is always why memory allocation can be quite tricky then we have stored the value of v which is going to be 32 bytes anyway to um the pointer or the pointer location ptr so it's obviously going to start from there write 32 bytes and then it will move on to the next function of returning so we're going to look at the begin again of the pointer we're going to read 32 bytes and then simply return it because it's a uint and a very primitive data structure it's going to return a very simple value of 15. now if you were going to return something like a byte array which this is where we start getting complicated um, a byte array would actually start or the value of the byte array would start and actually value 40 because it's actually the first 32 bytes actually that's uh, a wrong a wrong usage of it there but you actually would start writing say for instance if this was to array would be simply uh, add this, uh, to a, and you actually would return 40 so say for instance if that would be a byte array which if i'm correct we can return like i think that would work We could try bytes one. I've not actually tried this. This is just something I'm literally trying out right now for the first time. Uh, so to sign that, that should hopefully return bytes one. This is my error. I'm just uh, this is uh, something I'm just testing just to see if it does. And this essentially will create a byte array or should create a byte array with the value of one. And something I have actually made the mistake of here. this is a byte array therefore I also need to define the length so I also need to store m store um, ptr1 because there is only one element in the array and I think that simply actually doesn't need to be bytes will this error let's all find out trying to think that wouldn't have worked would it have worked as a uint array is that what I was thinking of let's find out it's a uint array of too many values hmm I did create an array but I think I have added too many values to it either way I'd have to correct that to find out uh, it has been a while since I've actually done any of the byte array stuff. I have done something similar in the past. I can't remember. I don't know why I actually sort of uh, started going into this and experimenting into this during the tutorial. But either way, um, just a side note, if you are doing anything with sort of arrays, the first value within the array has to be the length of the array, followed by then the sequential values. I've probably screwed something up somewhere, but either way, that's essentially in a nutshell inline assembly. I've even thrown myself off trying to actually do this but either way i hope you found this useful if you did leave a thumbs up um, if you're interested in any more videos that i will be producing and i probably will go more into this whole byte array thing when i do uh, pure or inline functional or operational assembly um feel free to hit the subscribe other than that if you have any questions or comments leave them in the comment box down below and i will leave it there and i hope you the best with programming solidity and i'll catch you next time